The Monster Below by Greenback, read by Deathlight. Chapter 16, Books, Scrolls, and Hidden Places. Sleep didn't come that night. I lay in bed, a thought tracing through my mind. My little secret was still a secret, but for how long? What if Mangus went to coin counter and spilled the beans? What if he told my parents and they pretended to be calm so I'd be at ease when the cops came? The night dragged on, so I tried to figure out how to escape from my impossible situation. Sooner or later, Mangus would reveal my secrets. Knowing him, I couldn't bribe Mangus or convince him not to squeal. Every option I considered kept coming back to the only course of action I could take. I had to kill Mangus Bluehorn. Of course, I couldn't actually do it. Breaking into a building was one thing, but killing a pony to silence him was going too far. But what could I do? I couldn't run away, nor could I say he was lying. For the librarian could come forward, present whatever evidence she had, which meant I had to kill her too. But I couldn't do that either. I didn't want to go from being a celebrity to becoming a murderer. And if I had to silence the librarian to keep her from squealing, then who would I have to kill to keep the identity of her murderer from leaking out? Would I have to go around killing ponies left and right until all of the question was buried under a mound of corpses? It was four in the morning and I realized there was only one way to stop Mangus. If I wanted to beat him, I'd have to go to the police and confess what I had done at the library, depraving him with the satisfaction of turning me in. Considering how long I had been since the break-in, and that no one had been hurt, perhaps the authorities would be lenient on me. Dawn was still a few hours off, and there was still time to sneak back into town, take the train, and go to Manhattan. A short stay with the equestrian legal system, and I'd be free of Mangus and the librarian forever. I almost got out of bed when another thought hit me. Ponies revere those who give their all to help Equestria, putting them on a pedestal, so to speak. Ponies on pedestals were special, they couldn't be touched. They're idols, and ponies tend to forget or forgive any mistakes their idols did when they were younger. That was it, that was my answer. I had to elevate myself to the size of a pony that everyone looked up to. If I could become famous for helping the poor, the disabled, and the helpless, who would dare try to prosecute me? The only problem was, how was I going to elevate myself to such a lofty height? Oh sure, I could donate to charities and spend time in the soup kitchens and build houses for the homeless, but every famous pony does that. I needed something more, and as the first rays of the sun began to creep over the horizon, I began to connect the threads. I already gained fame by becoming a quasi-Pegasus pony, but if I could somehow get a horn, I could elevate myself to Alcorn status. I could be free to fly wherever I wanted to go and use my magic to impress others. Raise a house? How about raise five at once? Soup kitchens? I could magically create liquid mana to keep ponies from ever going hungry again. I could become a hero, and then no pony, not Mangus, not the librarian, could ever hope to stop me. That was it. It was so simple. If I got a horn, then I could turn the tide of the public opinion and elevate myself beyond the reach of the law. It was so simple, so perfect. And all I had to do was find a horn. I finally got to sleep, waking up around lunchtime and feeling much better. Breakfast was still laid out for me when I came down. In a search revealed, I had the house all to myself. A peek out the windows revealed a shimmering, nearly transparent forest field, most likely laid down as a protection against hecklers. Taking advantage of the peace and quiet, I headed to the small library on the second floor, finding the shelves full of thrillers, books on gardening, cooking, and the history of Equestria among other topics, including some from my favorite childhood books. It was time to go through them again, but I focused on the books, talking about Equestria history, hoping to find inspiration on where I was going to find a horn. Sadly, nothing fit the bill. I even tried a few of my old fairy tales, where the hero would gain magic and perform heroic deeds, researching to see if they held any basis in historical facts, a search that ended in disappointment. I was about to leave the library when I noticed a thick box nestled in the corner. Curious, I opened the lid, coughing at the dust that bailed it out. 
Waving it away, I found several books inside. The titles upon the spine was written in a language I couldn't understand. Pulling one out, I opened it, only to see the pages fall out, disintegrating as they hit the floor. Whatever these books were, they were old. Possibly older than my parents and their parents before them. There is one title that didn't seem as fragile as the others. The book was barren on labels, save for the initials QQ on the bottom right corner. Aside from its obvious age, there was little to distinguish the book from the others, but something about it caught my attention. Cracking it open, I found it was written in a question's common tongue. Instead of the older, fancier language I couldn't decipher. Treating back to my room, I closed the door and locked it. Not wanting to be disturbed as I opened the title page and found the words. Here within lies the recorded words and thoughts of Quiverquill. Scribe and scholar of Sadalanka, written within. Quiverquill, the name seemed familiar. It was only after a few minutes that I remembered him. He was an ancestor of mine. My dad's grandfather, to be precise. I didn't know much about him, except he's looked upon as a kooky pony. Always searching for some lost civilization or treasure. Or whatever it was that caught his attention at any particular moment. It was interesting to think I was holding a journal of a pony who had died well over 200 years ago. So, I dove right in. Who knew what one of my oldest ancestors had to say? As it turned out, quite a bit. Quiver Quill wrote at length about treasures in cities that have been lost to time. Buried under mountains or at the bottom of the sea, and detailed his expeditions to find them. Yet, all ended in failure, even when he was convinced that a very tiny artifact, treasure, or item he found was concrete proof that whatever he was looking for existed. As a whole, it was interesting reading, but there really wasn't anything relevant to me until I got to the last page. November the 15th. It's unbelievable. Absolutely preposterous. I can barely keep my focus right now, thanks to the ruffians from Canterlots. They came over to my house this morning and destroyed all my research on the horn. I tried to stop them, but several of their guards had magic far more powerful than mine. It held me in place while all my maps, notes, books, and journals regarding to the horn was burned to ash, then tossed to the winds. I fought as hard as I could, but they were focused to use a sleeping spell. And when I came to, I found a note apologizing for the sudden intrusion. But the orders had come from the sisters themselves, saying that it was a matter of safety that the horn wasn't found. The real decree from the sisters themselves was there, along with a large bag of bits and an apology for what they had done, but I didn't care. Years of work, gone. Reduced to ash because the princesses apparently are a superstitious and cowardly lot. Thankfully, they didn't destroy this journal. Most likely because I made sure to keep all references to the horn out of it. And if I'm really lucky, not all may be lost. I have yet to check a hiding place in the secondary floor bedroom. Hopefully, it's still there. Secondary floor bedroom. From what I knew, our house had been refurbished or touched in decades, perhaps longer. At most, we got a new coat of paint, some spells to strengthen the old frames, but that was about it. And my bedroom was the only one on the second floor. My legs felt unnaturally light when I reached my room, looking for a spot where a book could be hidden. But two hours of searching revealed nothing. I was on the verge of giving up when I got a thought. If I wanted to find a book later, I'd do so in the wall, preferably somewhere out of the way where it'd be inconvenient to take it down. The room's walls and floors were too obvious, but I had yet to check the closet. Opening the closet, I went inside and turned on the light. The room, if I could call it that, was small and cramped with dressers, boxes, and shelves. But I didn't let that deter me as I yanked, tugged, and pulled them out, tapping the walls in hopes of hearing an echo. An hour of sweat, grime, and tapping brought me nothing, except the need for a shower. With the walls being dust, I turned my attention to the floor, tapping away. I reached the furthest, darkest corner when a tap on the floor yielded a firm wood, but also the sound of a very slight echo beneath it. I tapped again, and the echo returned. Grabbing a hammer, I tore away at the floor, breaking into a small, dark and dirty hole beneath the frames. There was a cloth-covered object inside, covered in dust, dirt, and grime. 
I gave a little shriek of joy when I yanked the object out and brought it to my desk. Unwrapping the fabric, I found a book similar to Silver Pearl's journal. The wrap had protected it, but the pages still had the unmistakable smell of mildew. I'd have to be much more careful reading that book, for fear of it falling apart. That's when there was a knock on the door, and my mother called in, saying that Bee Breaker wanted to see me downstairs. I almost refused, thinking she wouldn't have come over to see a pony who had hit her in the nose. Yes, it had been an accident, but I had no idea how she would react to such an act. But ignoring her and trying to pretend the event had never happened would only make things worse. Putting the book away, I shoved all the cabinets and shelves back into place, wiped the sweat and grime away, combed my hair, took a deep breath, and headed downstairs. Bee Breaker was in the lobby, two large baskets draped across her back. Bee Breaker? I said, and not sure how to proceed. Deciding the caution was the best course of action. I kept my tone sympathetic. You, uh, you film better? Oh yes, I am. She gestured the baskets. You busy today? I was eager to read Quiver Quill's book. But needing to soothe any hurt feelings between Bee Breaker and me came first. No, I don't have anything in mind. Well, I'd love to go around and see more Sotolanka's scenery, but I could use a guide. She popped on the baskets open, revealing food and a thick blanket. I thought we could have a picnic while we're out. The book called me like a siren, but I ignored it. Really, well, I don't mind. But getting away from Mangus will be a problem. I doubt it, the last I saw him, he's sleeping like a log. Bee Breaker gave me a sly smile. He should probably check his coffee to make sure nothing has slipped into it. After making sure we had everything, the two of us headed through the barrier, surrounded the house, and headed into the forest. Unlike the fabled Everfree Forest near Ponyville, the forests of Sadalanka were quite tame, with few dangers. So the two of us were free to walk about at our own leisure. I enjoyed taking Bee Breaker to the many sites I frequented as a child. From old swimming hole to a large outcropping on the side of the mountains that gave a good view of the vast forests. I even took her to the crystal caves, which she was gossmacked at seeing the massive crystals thrusting from the walls, especially in the waterfall chamber. As noon came around, I took her to a large hill at the edge of the forest, giving us a nearly limitless view of the plains stretching out to the horizon. Long one of my favorite childhood spots for imagining what lay beyond that horizon. Bee Breaker soon had her checkered blanket spread out, and the two of us ate lunch, watching scattered clouds passing through the bright blue sky. As I ate my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I noticed something. For the first time in a long while, I forgot about the wings, about Medicomp and the protesters. It was just me and Bee Breaker enjoying ourselves. It felt really good. So, I asked Bee Breaker, uh, how's your nose feeling? Well, it's a bit itchy every now and again, but that's it. I hesitated, unsure what to say. Listen, Bee Breaker, I. She held up a hoof. I know you didn't mean to hit me, it was an accident, nothing more. It was a relief to know that Bee Breaker was in a forgiving mood. It had just been a rough couple of days. It won't happen again. Bee Breaker nodded. A lot of ponies saw your outbursts as proof that adding the wings did something to your brain. May Coin Counter think of canceling the trip. What? I overheard him talking to some of his advisors. With all the hecklers we've been getting, he's seriously considering scrapping the whole thing. That didn't sound like Coin Counter. Well, he's one of the best bosses anyone could ask for. He was still a business pony and wanted to make money. Giving up on a tour less than halfway through meant things must be going worse than I thought. You think he's going to do it? Me Breaker shrugged. Who knows, I doubt it. I heard of him talking about going to Canelot then calling it a day. My heart skipped a beat. You're serious? Well, it makes sense. If we make a great impression with the princesses and get their approval, that would silence all the critics out there. Unless we make a catastrophic impression instead. Bee Breaker nodded. But if anyone can impress the princesses, it's you. Could I? My talents were useful against normal ponies. But the princesses had the strongest will in Equestria. There is no way I could abandon them to my will. 
and it'd be futile to even try. Noticing my blank look, Beatbreaker said, Still, Coin Counter hasn't made up his mind yet, and if he were to try to schedule it, it'd probably take a while. And I, well, I wouldn't mind staying here for a bit longer. She looked around, admiring the view. It's just so peaceful. Closing her eyes, Beatbreaker gave the loveliest smile. Her hair billowing in the soft breeze. I was content to just sit and watch her. Oh Celestia, I wish I could see that smile now, after everything that's happened. We spent the rest of the afternoon wandering about Sadalanka, taking care to stay away from ponies that might recognize us, reaching the path to take us home well after dark. I'll catch up with you later, Breed Breaker said. Need to go check in with Coin Counter and catch up with everything. But as she started off, I thought about what she said and raised my hoof. Hey Beat Breaker, you want to change the scenery? Maybe stay at my parents' place. She stopped. Really? Yeah, my folks have a guest bedroom we can use. I didn't tell her that Mangus would have to be kicked out, but I figured she wouldn't care. Alright, I'll be back as soon as I can. As she headed back to town, I trotted through the forest, eventually coming back to my parents' house. Lit up with candles in the twilight. Mingus was on the porch and was unhappy to see me. Where the hell have you been? Do you have any idea? I went inside the house, locking the door behind me. My parents were waiting near the kitchen table. And I briefly felt like a young colt again, about to be scorned about being out too late. Where were you? Mom asked. Your father and I were getting so worried. Don't you know the entire town is out to get you? Dear... Dad said, you're exaggerating. Well, maybe a little, but there's a lot of ponies out there that aren't happy to see you, Silver so Speak. This isn't the time to be running about. I wasn't running about, I was out showing Bee Breaker around. Mom was surprised. You mean that the two of you were actually out and about all day? Well, yes. Mom got a huge smile. Well, that's good. Where is she, by the way? On her way over, I hope the two of you don't mind. But I suggested she could stay overnight in the guest room. Oh, well, we don't mind at all, but I'm afraid Mangus has the guest room. Dad glanced at Mom. He could sleep outside. True, but no, that'd be rude. But there's no reason we have to turn Beatbreaker away. Mom smiled at me. Why don't we have her stay with you in your room? Wait, with me? Of course, it'd be like a sleepover. I better go get some blankets and extra pillows. She tried outside the room, leaving Dad and me behind. Well, she seemed awful... excited? Dad nodded. Why wouldn't she be? Beatbreaker's a star, and a real one of that. She's polite, charming, and not a boastful braggart. I noticed that while Dad was praising Beatbreaker, he seemed uncomfortable about something. As if there was an embarrassing thought he couldn't put into words. Is there something else that Mom is interested in? I mean, I don't recall her being that excited when I had a slumber party. Dad's awful silence remained. Dad? Taking a deep breath, Dad reached beside the couch and pulled out a bunch of newspapers. Take a look at these. I did. They were covering my journey all the way from my reveal in Manhattan to arriving in Sadalenka. Look closer. Look at all the pictures. I did. Most of them were similar, showing me either heading down the stage Flying or answering questions from the audience. Nothing out of the ordinary. When I took a closer look, I noticed something. In each photo, Beat Breaker was never far from me, and was always watching me with a smile. But there was something about it I couldn't put my hoof on. Don't you realize it, Silver Speak? She likes you. Well, we're friends. We've been working together for... I know, I know, but I don't mean it like that. I mean, she, you know, really likes you. It took me a moment to realize what he was saying. Silver speak, she follows you around like a loyal bloodhound. Your mother and I thought you would have noticed by now. I didn't have an answer for him. I hadn't even thought I'd be Breaker as anything more than a friend. To think that she was interested in me. Have you thought about if, well, you two would make a good match? What? No, I... Your mother's been wondering why you haven't found a special sun pony yet. I gave a sly grin. She's been dropping hints about how wonderful it would be to have grandkids. I stared at Dad, shocked that he thought that Beatbreaker was trying to come on to me. 
perhaps for months or even a year, and that I had been blind to it. A part of me dismissed such a crazy notion, the two of us were just business partners, and friends at most. The kind of friends who went out for donuts and enjoyed spending time together, not the kind who wanted something more. There was a knock at the door, I went over to open it, and found Beatbreaker standing there. Hello? She chirped. Can I come in? I watched for a moment. Outwardly, nothing has changed, but it was like I was looking at her for the first time. Oh, um, of course. I stood aside, but no sooner had Beatbreaker entered than Manga stormed inside, closing the door behind him, checked off of having been shut out. His gaze implied that he'd make sure that it wouldn't happen again. Mom came in, blankets and pillows slung over her back, which she then transferred to Beatbreaker. Here you go, Beatbreaker. We'll be getting a cold front in the next few days, so these should help. Then to Mangus. Mangus, here's your blankets. I noticed the mom had given Mangus the thinnest blankets in the house. Now if any of you need anything during the night, the toy's down the hall, and the snacks and drinks are in the kitchen downstairs. So we speak, why don't you show Beatbreaker to your room? It's been a long day, and I'm sure you two are pooped. Beatbreaker was eager to head upstairs. I started up after her, glancing at my parents and their sheepish grins. Mom indicated for me to go after Beatbreaker and possibly do more if I could help it. It dawned on me that Beatbreaker might have interpreted my overnight invitation in a way I never imagined. I found Beatbreaker waiting for me at the top of the stairs and led her to my room, nervous about what was going to happen inside. But there was no romantic overtones as Beatbreaker whistled upon entering. Oh, what it wouldn't have given to have a place like this when I was little. You mean it didn't have a room of your own? We had tents and yurts, never stayed in one place too long. Going to a spot next to the bed, I cleared away a spot for Beatbreaker to sleep, trying to keep my mind off what Dad had told me. Well, what embarrassing childhood mementos do we have here? I turned and saw her going through some of the boxes I had pushed aside. Uh, nothing, just a lot of... Wow, never knew anyone had such a large Celestia collection. Beatbreaker pulled out several books, posters, and little figures of Celestia I had displayed throughout my room. You really were into her, weren't you? I blushed, slightly berating myself for not putting away the things when I had the chance. Nothing to be ashamed of. Beatbreaker assured me. After all, she is the princess. I thought she was so cool. I confessed. Other young ponies decorated their rooms and wondered about memorabilia, or trinkets commemorating their favorite stars, cartoon shows, and books. I decorated my room with memorabilia the princess who guided the big ball of burning gas in the center of our solar system. What about Luna? Oh, I thought she was cool too, but Celestia, there's something about her that spoke to me. Like she was the perfect big sister that you looked up to. Beatbreaker chuckled as she took the clay figure of the princess. Oh my gosh, I remember that. I took the figure in my hooves. I made this for an art class back in kindergarten. The teacher told us to make something we really liked. The figure was crude, barely more than a fat blob with four stumps for legs, and outlandish colors to indicate the mane and tail. But I still see all the spots where young pony did the best he could, wanting to pay tribute to something he adored. Let's take it with us. What? Let's take it with us. If we're going to Canterlot, you can show it to Celestia. My cheeks turned redder than a boiled beet. No, I mean, it's so old. I can't imagine she'd want to see it. Besides, you probably get so many of them daily from other children. I... Be bigger snatch the figure out of my hooves. Okay, then. I'll take it to her. But I... Think about it. If you married her so much as a cult... Then that made you want to be like her, and look where you ended up. I wanted to argue with her, but realized it was futile. No way was I going to be able to change Beatbreaker's mind. Especially if she could get a giggle at my expense. Yanni, Beatbreaker put the figure back in the box, then set the blankets and pillows on the floor. I realized that, being the guest of the house, it wasn't proper for her to sleep on the hard floor and that it was rude for even considering having her do such a thing. You can have the bed, I'll take the floor. We bigger shook her head. That's okay, believe me, I'm used to it. Spent a lot of time on the floor in my dorm, and on the floor when I was a filly. 
Doesn't mean you still have to do it now. She chuckled. True, but this is your house, and I'm your guest. My parents' house, technically. It's the thought that counts, and I really don't mind sleeping on the floor. You sure? Be bigger crawl between the blankets. Yes. Well, okay, just let me know if you change your mind. Nodding, be bigger settled down. But not quite so much that she went to sleep. She looked up at me for a moment, and I back at her. Feeling as if I should say something, or perhaps ask a certain question. From the way she watched me, it seemed as if she was waiting for me to do so. It was so strange, I could charm and bend others to my will, influence an entire corporation on the path to take, and charm birds from the trees. Yet, I couldn't find the courage to ask Bee Breaker if she had feelings for me. The moment passed, Bee Breaker yawned and laid her head down to sleep. Getting into bed, I pulled the covers over myself and did the same. Good night, Silver Speak. Bee Breaker said, I couldn't tell if she was disappointed or not. Good night. I heard the sound of movement sometime during the night. Waking, I listened and realized it was Bee Breaker. After my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw Bee Breaker staring on the floor, turning over and over in an attempt to find a comfortable position. Can't sleep? She nodded. Without thinking, I shoved myself to the side of the bed and pulled the comforter back, inviting her in. After a moment, Bee Breaker did so. It was only when she pulled her side of the comforter up, and I felt her body heat start to accumulate. Did I realize that I let her sleep with me? Well, an innocent gesture on my part, I realized she might misinterpret it. A snore interrupted my thoughts. Bee Breaker had gone back to sleep, her romantic interlude not in her mind. As I settled down to sleep once more, I felt Bee Breaker's hoof touch mine. Unlike most of my classmates back in school, I had never gone on dates or flirted with other ponies. The world of romance was completely unknown to me, along with its rules, gestures, and flirting techniques. Feeling Bee Breaker's hoof touch mine, even if it had been an instant gesture from a sleeping brain, it made me envious of those who had experienced it in dating. It was flattering to think that other ponies found me attractive, but I didn't know if I wanted to return the favor. Oh, I like Bee Breaker as an individual. If anyone were to ask me to a party or social gathering, I would politely decline. But if Bee Breaker asked me, I would go along with her. After all, she had given me the chance to follow my dreams. I owed her so much. Besides, she was charming and become quite friendly with me. And whenever she had been close to me, I felt calmer. As if her mere presence was enough to dispel my worries and fears. And then, there was her smile, that beautiful, relaxing smile of hers. I shook my head, yes, I like Bay Breaker as a friend, but I had to keep my priorities in mind. I had wings, but not a horn. If I could somehow get my hooves on one and get it attached, then my lifelong dream would be fulfilled. Getting in a romantic relationship with another pony would only delay that dream from coming true. Perhaps, after that dream came true, I could pursue a relationship. I lay in bed, feeling Beat Breaker's hoof next to mine. After a while, I reached out and touched hers with mine as well. The sleep I had during that night was among the best I ever had, and when I woke up the following morning, I felt ready to leap out of bed and face the day. Beat Breaker was still asleep, her main lit by the morning light streaming through the window. Filtered from the clouds moving in, suggesting we were going to have a storm later that day. I slowly slipped out of bed, thinking of going down to prepare breakfast. After all, what kind of host didn't bring a guest breakfast in bed? I was almost at the door when I glanced at my desk and saw Quiver Quill's book. And all that happened the day before, I had completely forgotten about it. But its pages seemingly called to me. Bee Breaker snorted, rolling under the sheets. If we were going to spend the day together, I wouldn't get a chance to read through the book. I could spare a few minutes to read the book before she woke up. What harm could that do? Pulling up a chair, I took the book and began to read. I had hoped to find a complete story of Quiver Quill's now destroyed notes, but was disappointed to find it was a grab bag of quickly scribbled fragments. It was likely copied in a hurry. 
But the more I read, the more complete picture began to emerge of what Perfect Quill had originally researched about. One note near the back caught my attention. Though it was long persisted in rumor and speculation, I had finally found proof that the legend of the Cursed King was in fact true. Point is I point out there's no truth to the legend, and that researchers and scholars like myself were only wasting their times to study it. But I can explain why there's no proof. All the evidence was destroyed. From what I can tell, the subjects of the Cursed King hated him so much, and yet feared his power so greatly, that they took all matters to ensure that his very existence was erased from history, presumably by destroying his manuscripts and scrolls along with any visual representation of him. Considering how their civilization itself died out shortly afterwards, it appears that they would have succeeded. There was a hastily scribbled drawing of a scroll on the next page. I found the scroll inside a hidden cave within the Blue Mountains. It's a letter from one of the last living civilians of the Long Lost Kingdom, who apparently decided to question and need to remember the evil king's deeds, so that they would never repeat those mistakes the king did. I have yet to translate it beyond the first few lines, as the language is fiendishly difficult to decipher, but it gives directions too. Unfortunately, time and the explosion of mildew rendered the next few pages completely unreadable, and the paper is heavily damaged. I had to read ahead several pages to find the next readable portion of text. Outrunning the guards, my dead friend also had taken some with him. In great secrecy, several tapestries the king had made himself. But while there, I also found written history of the king's deeds, which is far too detailed and comprehensive to be a forgery. I intend to copy it fully to this book, but for now, a short summary will suffice. Long ago, there was a kingdom in the northern borders of the Blue Plains, though not as large or as powerful as the neighboring kingdoms. It was blessed with an abundance of natural resources that were much envied. To protect itself, the kingdom's ruler, a unicorn of superior magical talent, used all his skills and magic to enclose his kingdom within a magical dome to protect the kingdom from those who wished to invade it and take it all for themselves. But then, the king began to change. He grew to see himself as a god. He grew to demand tribute and eventually sacrifice. And he protested how their brains wiped clean and turned into mindless slaves. And that filled the coward's subjects. He then used his magic to enslave their very essence to himself, so they could use their energy to live forever, grow stronger, and eventually conquer all of Equestria itself. It was the turning point. The king's guards fought back and defeated him. They forcibly removed his horn and, as punishment for his deeds, took him deep beneath the mountains and entombed him, so that he would never see the lands he desired to rule. Spells were cast, cursing him to live forever in a never-ending silence, so they could never call out for help or speak another blasphemous word. They buried his horn next to him, so that the means of his conquest would always lie within reach, yet forever be out of grasp. And so they left him there, where no one would ever find him. Such spells are nonsense, of course. No one knows any such incantations. But it seems that the rest of the text is true. I must try to find out more. The next several pages were too damaged to read. Only the final page in the book was legible, containing a single entry. I have found it, the way into the mountains. The map led me to the precise location, which, astonishingly enough, is right underneath Salonka. But I don't want to rest suspicion, so I have, in great secrecy, began to dig this passageway from the basement of my home. With any luck, I shall finally break through and find the cursed king himself. Reaper stirred, pushing the comforter aside. I quickly snapped the book shut and pushed it into a drawer. Morning, Reaper said, stretching so hard I heard her joints crack. She snapped out of bed and looked at me. Well, what's got you so cheerful this morning? Oh, I don't know. Just feels like something big is coming. Is it good? I smiled. Oh, yes. <laughs>